Thank you, Anu, and welcome. It's great to see so many people here at the conference. Um, so as Anu said, and I, I'm, I'm sure you know, the theme of the conference is productive achievement, and I put it as man's noblest activity, and that's Ayn Rand's description of it uh, in the afterword or the note about the author at the end of Atlas Shrugged when she's encapsulating her philosophy, and she calls productive achievement man's noblest activity, and she means it. Um, and the conference, so we're, uh, Anu said, we're celebrating productive heroes. Um, so there's going to be talks, as she said, uh, Andy this afternoon is going to be talking about some Pittsburgh business heroes. We're going to have some people reflecting on their careers of tremendous achievement and, and lessons learned and, and what new and young people can take to heart uh, uh, as advice. We're going to have people uh, talking about current businesses and work that they're doing. So that's part of the theme. But... Anu said it's also Atlas Shrugged's uh, 60th anniversary. And part of the theme is objectivism's unique acknowledgement, recognition, and celebration of productive achievement. And that's the aspect that I'm going to focus on in regard to today's talk and to try to set a little bit of a framework and a little bit of a context for the whole conference and what is to come. And one way that you can view what Ayn Rand does with objectivism and what the philosophy is all about, it's about giving full recognition and full understanding for the most significant development in the last two centuries. And that, th you've probably seen a graph like this because economists use it very often. This is the world until, so it ends at 2000. This is GDP per capita, so it's wealth the amount of wealth that exists in the world. Um, and it's broken down by region, uh, uh, the US, Western Europe. And, so and what you see here is a tremendous, tremendous explosion of wealth, of the amount of wealth that exists in the world from 1800, uh, from about 1800 onwards. And it's just, it's an astonishing, astounding, tremendous explosion. And what an intellectual and what a philosopher should be doing, if they have any concern or consideration for life, is trying to understand this. What made it possible? What are the conditions that will allow it to continue? What could you do to further this? What might hamper it? What might strangle it? <clears throat> this is the most significant development in the last 200 years. And we're in the midst now of another tremendous explosion in productivity. I think Iran will be in later in the week talking about that a little bit and with the advent of the age of the internet and now with AI and so on. It's, this is, it's, it's such a significant achievement uh, and development. And you can think of it, um, it's a massive increase in quantity of life, so in life expectancy that happens from 1800 onwards, and in quantity of life of just the number of people who now can exist on Earth. I mean, a lot of us wouldn't be around absent this development. So it's an increase in the quantity of life and in the quality of life. I mean, it just the kind of control and enjoyment and the kind of choices you have in life, the kind of way in which you can design the type of life you want to lead. When you look pre-1800 to post-1800, it's just so dramatically different. <clears throat> and this is what one should be trying to understand. And I think this is what Ayn Rand tried to understand. And this uh, objectivism is very much about this. And particularly when you get to the point where she's writing Atlas Shrugged, she's thinking a lot about the Industrial Revolution and its full significant, its full meaning. She's thinking about this development. Um, and it's the, the angle that I want to look at in terms of her thinking about the Industrial Revolution and what's really showcased in uh, Atlas Shrugged, you can think of the, 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 this graph as there's two things going on. There's a tremendous explosion in knowledge, and that predates the 1800s into the 1700s and 1600s. A tremendous explosion in knowledge, of the, just the amount of knowledge of what man knows about nature. A tremendous explosion, and as a result, a tremendous explosion in innovation, in invention, and in then in industry, in business, in banking, that leads 
to the amount of wealth that now exists in the world, a tremendous burst of productive activity. And what this involves, and I think one of Atlas Shrugged's unique perspective on this is something distinctive about Ayn Rand and about objectivism. And so this is a quote from Atlas Strug. This is Ragnar Danesky-Old speaking in one of the great scenes, his first meeting with uh, Hank Reardon. And this is what he says motivates him. And I'm going to very much be sp focusing on this issue of motivation. This is what he says. My only love, the only value I care to live for, is that which has never been loved by the world, has never won recognition or friends or defenders. Human ability. <clears throat> and this is, we're talking here of moral recognition, of moral defenders, of moral friends. Human ability. And what objectivism is about is this. So I think Ragnar, I mean, this is Ragnar, I've quoted Ragnar. I think Ayn Rand, both in terms of principle, ob obviously this is her view, but I think in terms of her special motivation, what she's animated about <clears throat> and what she's writing about is in defense and recognition and acknowledgement of human ability. And that this is what objectivism is all about. So objectivism is about a love of productive activity. And this is both a moral issue. So the issue of making the most of your ability, of putting in the effort of, and the thought and of planning out what you're going to do with your life and what kind of life you're going to lead. This is an issue of choice, of will, of effort. It's a moral issue. But this, this orientation of a love of productive activity is both a moral viewpoint and a metaphysical viewpoint. It's a recognition of the special role that human ability plays in life. <coughs> and that of people of outstanding, incredible ability, what they contribute to life and how they advance mankind's knowledge, invention, and ability to produce. So it's, if, if you've read Atlas Shrugged and there's the discussion of the pyramid of ability, that's a metaphysical notion. It's about the men of genius, uh, individuals of genius, what they're able to, to accomplish and what they contribute to the advancement of civilization. And this is, th this is all over Atlas, that what one's orientation in life should be is to have this, to have a love of ability. And that there are people and whole causes and movements that don't. So it's a love of ability, well, as against what? Well, as against either just an indifference to human ability and to what it accomplishes or an outright resentment of it, or even a hatred of it. That this, I think what she comes to see in writing Atlas Shrugged is that this is a crucial, crucial issue in life and in terms of thinking about people's basic motivational structure. It's a love of ability versus an indifference, a resentment, or a hatred towards it. Um, and for those of you who've read the Romantic Manifesto, and when she talks about metaphysical value judgments, basic premises that people acquire fairly early in life that orient them towards the world and form a foundation for which they're going to build the value structure and what they're pursuing in life upon. This issue of one's attitude and orientation towards ability, I think is she comes to think of this is a major element of a person's metaphysical value judgments, and so the whole motivational makeup. <coughs> and that, uh, obviously, uh, objectivism takes a very strong stand in regard to this. And if you want to think of it, how it, one way that's simply encapsulated in Atlas Shrugged, as I say, it's all over the story, and I think in terms of trying to understand the story of what is going on. A simple encapsulation of it is to, to read or reread the, um, uh, the chapter in which you get the depiction of Franconia, uh, Francisco D'Anconia's childhood with Dagny and Eddie and Jim Taggart, and the difference in reaction and orientation of Eddie Willers towards Francisco, who's a child of, he's not only a moral child, but he's a child of tremendous, indeed almost freakish, ability. And what 
Eddie Willers' orientation towards that, which is it's tremendous, like he's astonished, but tremendous respect, admiration towards it, and Jim Taggart's which is at first sort of indifferent, a little resentful, and then through the story, mushrooms into outright hatred. <clears throat> and that, that's, I mean, those are three characters in the novel, but I think part of the whole meaning of the novel is that this is a tremendously significant issue in uh, understanding people and understanding the world, and it's part of or objectivism's whole orientation towards the world. And I want to talk about some aspects of this is not meant as an exhaustive list, but to say it's essential to objectivism's worldview that this orientation towards a real love of ability. I want to talk about it a little bit at a personal moral level of looking at objectivism's new moral philosophy from this perspective and, and from the perspective of its uh, deep thinking and rethinking of morality in light of the Industrial Revolution or the scientific and the Industrial Revolutions. And then touch a little bit on the way objectivism and Ayn Rand looked at intellectuals and intellectual history in, as a result of this being a fundamental orientation in life. And then a little bit about how objectivism and Ayn Rand approaches cultural issues and events and a little bit about political foundations. But three and four I'm going to go very briefly. I'm going to concentrate more on one and two here. And so, so let's start with the personal moral level. Um, so what the, it's been said, and I think very rightly, and it, there's a profound meaning to this, that uh, Ayn Rand would not have been able to formulate objectivism pre the Industrial Revolution. Um, and that's not just, oh, okay, like she, like everyone else, observed the Industrial Revolution. Its meaning is obvious and she applied that. I think she thought very deeply about it and what its full meaning is. And one way to put what its meaning is and in terms of morality is what the Industrial Revolution does and does really for the first time in history. It shows us what our means of survival is. So it shows mankind what its means of survival is. And this in a, in a, um, in a basic moral way. <clears throat> so one way you can think about this that I, I think is helpful to think what, what is so significant about the Industrial Revolution? What it shows is that mankind survives in a radically different way than other animals. And this is something Ayn Rand talks about and highlights in the Objectivist Ethics, so that's the lead essay of The Virtue of Selfishness, where she's outlined the, the whole theoretical structure of her morality. And she stresses that man's life is not like that of other animals. And in what kind of way? Well, that the life of other animals is a series of repeated cycles that go on over and over. Um, so, for instance, uh, where I'm living now, it backs onto woods, um, and there's right now all kinds of baby birds, baby uh, robins, blue jays. It's fun to watch them, watch them learning, to, the robins learning to dig up worms, learning to fly, stumbling about, crashing into things but they'll eventually learn. Next year, it's gonna be exactly the same thing. Exactly the same. It's not, oh, the robin will have found some new way to hunt worms that it's now teaching its young, or some new way to figure out how to fly, and that's the way it's teaching its young. It's exactly the same thing. It's a series of repeated cycles over and over. What you get with the Industrial Revolution and the, that massive grasp of wealth creation and thinking of what's behind that, development of knowledge and development of productive activity. Human life is not a series of repeated cycles. And it was easy to think that before, that it's just repeated cycles. You have your station or place in life. You have a caste system or you have a certain a feudal system where everyone knows their assignment and it, you're gonna go on doing that and then you teach it to your kid and they go on doing that. It was much easier to think of human life in terms of a series of repeated cycles. Now, it, what, it's not true of mankind's development. I mean, the rise from a cave to the first civilization and so on is a rise, but it's at such, relatively speaking, such a glacial pace in comparison to the Industrial Revolution that it's not obvious what is the significance of it to an individual human life in an individual human lifespan. But when you get to the Industrial Revolution and what it shows is possible to man and possible within one individual's lifetime. 
<clears throat> the kind of progress, and, and that was a societal value that came into existence as a result of the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, the kind of progress that is possible is, I mean, it's unprecedented, it's astounding, and it needs careful thinking about what its full meaning is. And what it needed, and what Ayn Rand sets out to do, it needs a whole new orientation to morality and to what virtue is about. <coughs> and that is what she does. And so here's one way of putting the new virtues. Rationality, productiveness, pride. This is the way, again, to go back to the objectivist ethics, the lead essay in The Virtue of Selfishness. This is the way she carves out values there. In Galt's speech in Atlas Shrugged, it's, you have one fundamental virtue, rationality, six derivative virtues, independence, integrity, honesty, justice, productiveness, pride. That's not the way she presents it in the objectivist ethics. And I think it's an interesting question to ask, why? Why a different presentation? Here you get three basic virtues, and she treats integrity and independence and honesty as just aspects of rationality, important aspects of rationality, but just aspects. Why is she carving it up like this? Well, one answer to this is these correspond to s crucial values she thinks anyone and everyone should be achieving if they want to be on the side of life, and that's reason, uh, purpose, self-esteem. But there's another reason I think it's carved up like this in the objectivist ethics. What is in common between rationality, productiveness, and pride, and is different than independence or integrity, is this focus on growth, ambition of a greed, as it's put in Atlas Shrugged, for more and more and more. <clears throat> and that this is all of what morality is about, is about constant expansion, constant growth, a constant upward climb of what the Industrial Revolution showed is possible to man. So rationality is crucial. I mean, this is crucial in objectivism's whole view of rationality, that what it is uh, is about the acquisition of more and more and more knowledge, a constant growing sum that you integrate into your existing knowledge, but it should be constantly growing. You should constantly have the attitude in life, if I knew then what I know now, man, I could have done so much more. I could have been so much more productive. I could have achieved so much more. And that should be a constant in life as you look back because you're constantly growing and expanding your knowledge. And productiveness is about also constant growth, a constant advancement of your values of, as Ayn Rand will often describe it, of climbing from level to level to level to level. But it's a constant upward progression. And pride, the, sh the way she encapsulates, she says the single easiest way to get what she means by pride is moral ambitiousness. <clears throat> An ambitiousness for the qualities of character, including crucially rationality and productiveness as virtues, that you're going to constantly develop, enhance, <clears throat> and grow within yourself so that you do achieve self-esteem. Self-esteem is not a one-and-done issue. It's a constant issue in life, and it requires constant growth. So you get a very different orientation in morality, that what it is, it's about growth and constant expansion and achievement. And I think this comes from her reflection on what is the full meaning and significance for, hu for human life <coughs> and for morality of the Industrial Revolution and, and what it highlights and what it showcases and what, if you're really thinking about its meaning, what it means. And think how different this is from the conventional, traditional list of virtues. Now, this is the religious, uh, uh, religious uh, virtues, but they're the t virtues that formed the base and the sort of the orientation and sense of life of culture pre-Industrial Revolution. And it's faith, hope, charity. These are startlingly, uh, I mean, in contrast, <coughs> not about growth, not about achievement, not about ambition. They're a bit much more on the side of passivity. <clears throat> so faith is, well, don't go out and investigate things, don't experiment, don't look, don't acquire knowledge, put arguments together, think if it's right or think what's wrong about it and prove it and so on. It's about believing. Just believe. Just accept. Just obey the authority. Sit back and be told 
what to do. Hope means that values, and, and importantly, and I'll, I'll come back to this in a, in a moment, the ideal is outside of your reach. You cannot achieve it. It's not within your power. It's not within your control. You have to hope for God's grace, forgiveness, salvation in the next life, but it's outside of your power, and it's crucially outside of your control. If you're going to be the elect or not, you'll find out. <clears throat> you can't achieve it. And charity is about thinking of yourself as unworthy, as sinful, as not someone who can grow, who can strive to progress, who can strive for, progression, uh, for perfection. Charity is about viewing yourself as, well, I'm unworthy, but hopefully someone will help me out. And the, I mean, the real act of charity in religion is God towards man. It's, you don't deserve it, but you might get it anyway. Or Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is the man without sin sacrificing for sinners who don't deserve it. It's not about earning your way in the world. <clears throat> and what you get in objectivism is a radically different view about morality and the whole thinking about morality than what is traditional. And I think it comes out of her thinking about the meaning of the scientific and industrial revolutions. And so what you get is a new understanding of idealism and the issue of hope productiveness is really, from objectivism's perspective, the issue of idealism. You get a conception um, of idealism that is this worldly, it's not awaiting some supposed next life in another dimension. It's this worldly and it's achievable. It's ideals that you can realize if you set out in the proper way and with the proper effort. But, and this again is the meaning of the industrial revolution and of thinking of this tremendous wealth explosion and what lies behind it. That the, what it shows man is that the ideal is achievable here, here on earth. I mean, it's not an accident she formulates it as capitalism, the unknown ideal. It's an ideal that is achievable if you're productive. <clears throat> And it's, it's, it's the diametric opposite of an attitude of hope towards life. So it's a conception of idealism that's this worldly. And the way she often formulates it, it's about reshaping the earth in the image of one's values. And that that's what the Industrial Revolution is about. That's what it showcases, of reshaping the earth in the image of one's values. And that this is achievable in life and in within your own life. <clears throat> um, and you can think this means much, much more than just working or holding a job, even a job that you like or a job that interests you. And it's much more even than a career orientation in too conventional a sense. So a way to think about this, because I, I think where this is, this is what Atler Shrugged is focused on, but to see of it at a, at a more individual level, think of the fountainhead. Most people in the fountainhead have jobs. They work. They even have a career orientation in a certain way. They start businesses or think of Peter Keating. You can think of him as he has a career orientation. He decides he's going to go into architecture. He's not going to do master's studies. And he wants to rise through the profession, and he wants to get to the top, and he has a certain view of how he's going to do that. And he joins Franken's firm because it's a prestigious firm, and then he's going to work his way up towards that. And in the process, he's designing buildings, and they're putting up buildings, and they're making money. But it doesn't count as productive from objectivism's point of view. All of that activity, none of it qualifies as productive because the essence of what production is about is recreating the world in the image of your values. And Keating doesn't have any values. This is part of the meaning of it. He's a second-hander. He doesn't have values. He, these are, he has no idea of the buildings I'm putting up, are they actually good or not? Do I like them? He doesn't really ask that question. He's uncertain if what he's doing is good. It's one of the reasons he constantly goes to Rourke for what, what do you think about what I'm doing. <clears throat> um, he doesn't, it's just, well, other people value this, so that's what I'm going to do. And the other people have the same kind of, I mean, it's a world of second-handers that you get in the fountain. They have the same kind of attitude. Well, I don't really know. You have to go ask somebody else. 
It's a, a vast emptiness, a string of zeros in the fountainhead. And the essential element that is missing is recreating the world in the image of your values. And you have to have real values, and you have to have a view of this is the kind of world that I want to help create, and that I want to help bring about, and that's what I'm setting out to do. <clears throat> and that's what productiveness means from objectivism's point of view. And again, I think this is what the Industrial Revolution dramatizes. So it's a necessary condition that it be your values that you're helping bring into existence. Now that's a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition, because it's not just, well, recreating the world in the image of your values. It, those have to be actual, genuine values, and you can be mistaken about that, and you can be radically mistaken about that, to take another character from another novel. What's so appealing about Andre in We the Living is that he has this orientation. His orientation in life is about recreating the world in the image of his values. What's so unappealing about Andre is what those values are. He's an idealistic communist who thinks by bringing communism into the world, I'm going to help lift up people, and finds out in the story that he's really, really, really mistaken about that. And what he's doing is hastening the demise of all the things he values. And he learns that through his relationship with Kira. And it's, I mean, he, he can't face that at the end. So it's a necessary condition that you're recreating the world in the image of your values, and that's your motivation. It's sufficient when that you're right about that and you're bringing real values into the world. But this is objectivism's whole orientation towards product productivity and towards war work uh, and towards holding a job or having a career. And it's a very different thing than just, well, I've got to put bread on the table or a roof over the head. No, th those are important, but that's not the essence of life, and that's part of what the Industrial Revolution showcases. So what you get simultaneously is a view, and a new view, I think, about individualism. What the core essence and root of individualism is. It's through productive activity and through work. This is, again, stressed in the fountainhead. So you get a unification or an integration of three things in the objectivist ethics that, it, that are crucial to its whole conception of ethics. It, the idealism, productivity, and individualism form an inseparable unity. There are three aspects of a single thing, of reshaping the world in the image of your values. It's your values, That's the and it's crucial that it has to be your values. I mean, Rourke has different values than Dagny does in Atlas Shrugged, <clears throat> or than Austin Heller does in The Fountainhead, who's a journalist. Rourke wants to bring buildings into the world. It's very personal to him. And you learn a little bit about the motivation that led to that and why he's interested in this and fascinated in it. It's highly personal, <clears throat> but it is real values that he's bringing into existence. And he's, that is what idealism, a proper conception of idealism, is about. This is what, how man can live, and this is how man should live, and this is what a pursuit of a this-worldly ideal looks like. So you get an interconnection of those three ideas. And I think that this perspective on life and what morality is about, this would not exist, and Ayn Rand would not have formulated it in this way pre-industrial revolution. So this is part, this is the, what it looks like for an intellectual or for a philosopher to be taking the industrial revolution seriously, that it is the single most astonishing development of the last two or two and a half centuries, to take it seriously and to rethink issues and to rethink philosophy in light of it. This is what intellectuals should be doing, and this is what Ayn Rand sets out to do, and it's a whole orientation to another way of thinking what the Industrial Revolution is about. It's about unleashing human ability. That is what it's about. <coughs> That is why there's such a dramatic improvement both in quantity and quality of life. And one should rethink uh, philosophy in light of the central role of human ability in life. So that is what Ayn Rand does. And it's also how she looks or how objectivism looks at what intellectuals are doing. 
and particularly of what modern intellectuals are doing. So that, that was the second aspect. To, get, to understand how she looks at other movements, other, I'm going to focus more just on individual intellectuals. She's looking, because people are often astonished by, like, she couldn't stand John Stuart Mill. Um, <clears throat> even though there's many positive things, I think, in what John Stuart Mill has to say and what he writes. I'm, I'll talk a little bit of why I think she couldn't stand him. So she has very strong and from, uh, you can put it, idiosyncratic reactions towards intellectuals. And objectivism does, and we're often uh, at questions or, or criticized in regard to that. And I think to get at the way she's looking at things, one has to get that she's interested in this issue of basic motivation. What is their reaction and attitude towards the scientific and industrial revolutions? So this incredible explosion of activity. Are they trying to understand it and genuinely grapple with the phenomenon or not? And the best of the thinkers, and I think the people she recognizes and admires in certain kinds of ways, are the people genuinely trying to understand and grapple with this. And you could say, again, this is not an exhaustive list, but here's four aspects of what it's crucial to try to grapple with. <clears throat> and that the best of the thinkers, and this you can think of it as the best of the Enlightenment thinkers, are the best within the best of the Enlightenment thinkers. This is what they're trying to do. These are the things they're trying to understand. So they're trying to understand, as a result of the scientific revolution, what it showcases is a power of reason that no one before expected and or to see realized. Um, the, what science and the new level of understanding and the union of math and science and how that had opened up the world and our ability to understand to experiment in and manipulate the world. This is a just, it's a tremendous, astonishing advance. And the best of the thinkers are trying to grapple with this. Yet what we have here is a new power in regard to reason and the human mind. What makes it possible? What are its conditions? What is the new scientific methodology? And how do you use that methodology? How do you apply it across the board in regard to all subjects? Not just science, but the humanities as well and philosophy. And the best of the thinkers, they're really grappling with this and trying to do this. Even if they're making from objectivism's point of view real errors, fundamental errors that have real and dramatically negative consequences, they're genuinely trying to understand. And this is true, I think, of a Descartes at his best. It's true of a Locke. It's true of a Leibniz. It's true of a Spinoza. <clears throat> Um, it's even true of Hume in a certain kind of way, though I think not uh, wholly, and perhaps not, I think Ayn Rand certainly viewed not essentially. But they're trying to understand this new method, trying to formulate it, and trying to apply it. That's at the level uh, of science and epistemology. At the level of morality, it's important to get that there are thinkers grappling with, in light of the scientific and then the burgeoning industrial revolution, we need to rethink and have different values and a different orientation, a different orientation towards the world. And there is rethinking going on. Again, from objectivism's perspective, not fundamental enough, not radical enough, not challenging assumptions uh, and certain basic premises enough, but it is going on. So someone like Locke <clears throat> puts a tremendous value in industriousness in a person being, that this is a new virtue, it's a value and orientation that a person should have. What politics properly is about, is one in one of uh, Locke's formulations, it's about protecting the rational and the industrious. <clears throat> and that is not what you would get in Christianity. <clears throat> so you get new a value orientation like that, or the importance of self-development <clears throat> and self-reliance. These are new notions coming into existence. Enlightened self-interest is the way some are formulating it. <clears throat> Jefferson's The Pursuit of Happiness. You get thinkers trying. Now again, it's not a whole moral revolution in the way that I think objectivism is and that Ayn Rand thought that it, what was required and what the Industrial Revolution deserved. But you get real rethinking going on. Um, and that this is what an intellectual should be doing, and she has respect for the people who are doing this. 
you get new legal and political principles that are needed and necessary both to secure the achievements of the modern world of the scientific and industrial revolutions and to carry them forward. On the political level, this is what Locke is doing and trying to do in the second treaties. <clears throat> At the legal level, there's all kinds of things going on. Um, Adam Mossoff will be talking about intellectual property. I'm sure he's going to either highlight some aspects of what was going on in the 18th and 19th centuries to secure intellectual property. And it, but if he doesn't, he knows a lot about that, so definitely you can ask about it in the Q&A. This is going on. And then at the level of economics, you get really a new field uh, of economics. Uh, it's to think of economics as launched by Adam Smith. One of the reasons to think that is what he's doing is taking seriously the advent, I mean, he's writing at the advent of the Industrial Revolution, and he's taking it seriously and trying to understand what makes the division of labor, why is it such a tremendous boost to productivity and trade and worldwide trade, and what are the conditions it requires, and how do we further this? I mean, the, the wealth of nations is uh, <coughs> inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, and what he's interested in, in is how do you, preserve this, and further it. And if you read Adam Smith, if you read The Wealth of Nations, and then in contrast read some 19th century philosophers, particularly of the German Romantic School, it's such a radically different orientation to wealth, to wealth creation, to what is going on in the world. Smith takes it seriously, what is going on, and views it as good. Whatever his faults or failings, that I think is his basic motivation. And that is the way Ayn Rand looks at it and why she has a favorable view of Smith in economics, of what he's trying to do. Because this is what intellectuals should be trying to do and what they should be grappling with. But these were not the only types of intellectuals. And even, as I put it, these were the intellectuals at their best. Not all the intellectuals are doing only this, even if they're doing some of this. So there were other forces in the, at loose in the world and other motivations going on, and it's important to understand the whole phenomenon to get what those other motivations were. So there were those who were trying to understand, but there were those who were compromising or appeasing with the enemies of ability, and you can put it as the enemies of the Industrial Revolution. And the compromise could have been inadvertent, but it was still compromise and concession to an opposite viewpoint of certain fundamental basic principles. So she would put and she puts Descartes on this side too, that he compromises, and the way that he compromises on the whole um, foundation of reason, that it's, it's essentially what you still have, his approach to thinking about the nature and power of reason, is religious. <clears throat> and it's with consciousness at the center of the world, and indeed, if you've read the meditations, what you need God to come in and save the day, to save human knowledge, otherwise it would collapse into skepticism, so right at the start, there's an incredible concession and compromise towards the old view and towards, from Ayn Rand's perspective, the enemies of human ability and, and putting it more concretely of the Industrial Revolution. So you get, that, you get that kind of compromise. And even worse, you get outright appeasement, which is much more conscious and deliberate than compromise need be. And this is where she puts a John Stuart Mill. As I said, I mean, my view of Mill is he's not only about appeasement. Um, there are many positive things in Mill and in, in his defense. So he, I think he's genuinely at an individual level. He's genuinely on the side of the individual. He's trying to defend individualism and the importance of being independent in life and that that be how one approaches one's life. But there's incredible appeasement of people with a different view and a different orientation towards life. Now this is a fairly lengthy passage that I want to quote, but it shows how open uh, and explicit the appeasement is. So this is from Mill's, uh, one of his two most famous works on liberty. And this is after pages of having uh, defended and identified the importance of individualism and the individual and of being independent. And then this is what he writes. He says, having said that it is only the cultivation of individuality which produces or can produce well-developed human beings, I might here close the argument. 
For what more or better can be said of any condition of human affairs than that it brings human beings themselves nearer to the best thing they can be? And what more do you need to say? Well, he adds, however, it is necessary further to show to those who do not desire liberty and would not avail themselves of it that they may be in some intelligible manner rewarded for allowing other people to make use of it without hindrance. So to the people who don't want to be free, wouldn't use freedom, wouldn't make anything of themselves, you have to show them they would be rewarded. Now this is so not Ayn Rand's orientation. Towards, I mean, think of Rourke in the Fountainhead, his courtroom speech. I've come here to say I do not recognize anyone's right to one minute of my time. Or putting it in terms of human ability of what Galt says to the world. You've been asking who is John Galt. I'm the first man of ability who refused to recognize it as guilt. <clears throat> That's what non-appeasement looks like. But there's a lot of this kind of thing going on. And Mill is a central figure. And she views him as he's appeasing and that the conservatives in the modern world picking up on liberty and mill as a defense is part of their whole attitude towards appeasement of recognized as enemies of human ability who don't aspire to anything in life, and those are the people you have to appease. So there was real appeasement going on. So not just compromise, but real appeasement. And then you have, I mean, even worse than that in certain ways, you have the people completely indifferent to what is happening. So they evade the need to rethink deep issues in philosophy, in morality, about life, in light of the scientific and industrial revolutions. <clears throat> and what, more than anything, I mean, I think there's various factors that go into the evasion. More than anything, it's the soul-body dichotomy that makes the evasion possible, that gives it intellectual framework and respectability, because it's What's going on in science and industry, that's, I mean, people are cutting up cadavers and bringing up oil and, and, and working with trains and engines and it's filthy and it's dirty <clears throat> and it's beneath one if one's concerned with the truly important spiritual things in life. So that dichotomy, the dichotomy between the material as lowly and without significant and you should not orient yourself towards it, and the spiritual would mean just the non-material, that that's what's significant, allowed incredible evasion of what was going on. Ayn Rand talks a lot about this uh, in the lead essay for the new intellectual, of this kind of evasion that was going on and what makes it possible. And if you read some 19th century figures and thinkers, it's astonishing when you think of, go, to go back to that graph of what is actually happening and what their attitudes towards life is and how they remain ossified in a pre-industrial viewpoint on the world. So there's a lot of that going on. And then the worst thing that is going on is there are people who are going to war against, against the industrial and scientific revolutions, against this unleashing of ability. And there's at least two ways in which that is going on. There's one frame of sort of mind frame or mindset that is urging people to abandon these things. So it's go back to nature, back to the Middle Ages, back to feudalism. That's when life was great. <clears throat> um, and there's a whole chorus of that in the 18th and then growing into the 19th centuries and certainly into the 20th. I mean, this is Ayn Rand's view of environmentalism, for instance. So it's either abandon it or take it over. Seize what is going on, seek to control it. So this was her view of... Uh, Sorry, the slide's cut off a little bit here, but this was her view of Marx. And if you have it, if you think of his famous slogan, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, that should have been seen as a declaration of war against human ability. <clears throat> it wasn't seen like that, but it should have been, and that's how Ayn Rand, I think, would have seen it and did see it in the 20th century. So you have a lot of opposing forces to what is going on. The best of the best of what the thinkers are doing and the people I think Ayn Rand respects, their orientation is towards human ability to grasping at some level that human ability has been unleashed. 
this is a tremendously positive thing that we need to try to understand and further. And then you have the people who are not doing that for various ways and in, in, and in various ways. So for various reasons and in various ways. But this is part, I think, of how one should understand what is going on in reaction to the Industrial Revolution and how Ayn Rand is looking at things. And as a consequence of this, so let me make, I'm looking at the time, let me make these last two points fairly quickly. As a consequence of this, this these orientations in life, that there are some people who genuinely admire and trying to understand the scientific and industrial revolutions, but there are many who are opposed to it, that carries out into the modern world. And particularly this orientation towards human ability carries into the modern world. And as a result, if you're trying to learn more about the way Ayn Rand thinks about things and trying to emulate, which I think is uh, a worthy goal, of trying to emulate her approach, when she looks at cultural issues, trends, events, her analysis is always, or virtually always, in terms of looking at it, what is the stand towards human productive ability that is embedded in the controversy and the dispute in the different sides? And this, this is sort of just a random, it's a laundry list of things. I spent about 15 minutes drawing up her analysis of, of so, so whether we're talking about political social systems, capitalism, whether we're talking about uh, ideologies like multiculturalism or environmentalism, whether we're talking about particular events like the death of Marilyn Monroe or the moon launch, whether we're talking about antitrust. I mean, you can go on and on. Her writing, why is she writing on the papal encyclicals, uh, on the development of peoples and of human life in her articles, uh, the Requiem, what Requiem for Man, uh, and of living death. Why is she writing and what is animating her in these analyses and how does she look at things? It's always from the perspective of what is the stand on human ability. So the papal, papal the encyclicals, it's what they reveal to her is, as she puts it, the sense of life of an institution. <coughs> sort of the whole orientation, maybe not always verbally and explicitly acknowledged, of an animosity towards human ability, towards human achievement, to people able to gain control of their lives. And her whole analysis of what is going on in those and why they're significant, because uh, she doesn't write about every encyclical that comes out, why they're significant is because they have this very radically different and evil orientation. But everything that she looks at, I'm not gonna touch on these, you can ask, in the Q&A if you want on some of these. But all of these, I think, to really understand her analysis and why she's adamantly on one side and not the other is you have to get, she sees that there's a stand, either good or bad, and bad is often uh, really bad, on the importance and the recognition of human ability and of its role in life. And the same then, this, I didn't want to end on this because this is a little negative, because uh, most of the trends that she's looking at in, in her contemporary world and contemporary culture are negative. One's approach to politics and to political principles, and particularly the foundation of politics, it's important both for understanding and then when you're trying to convey and convince other people that the foundational principle of politics, so of individual rights, is focused on human ability. That's the essence and the core of the principle. It's a means at a political social level of unleashing ability, of, of giving it the freedom to function and giving the individual the freedom to develop, to use, and then to gain the rewards of his ability. That's what individual rights are about they have to be formulated in the positive. It's the right to life, to liberty, to property, to the pursuit of happiness. <clears throat> They're formulated in terms of the positive because that's the core. Their core and why they're needed, why they're originated, what their purpose and function is. So it's not the right to commit suicide, practice astrology, gamble my money away on roulette, 
and loaf all day in my pajamas. Even though there's a sense in which the rights encompass that a person could do those things, that is not what rights are about. So if you empty rights of their metaphysical moral content and orientation, as I put it for Locke, it's about protecting the rational and the industrious. To understand that's the whole motivation for the issue of rights. That's how they have to be defended. That's why they're controversial, because they have this orientation. And if you empty rights of this content, you empty them of their real meaning, and you don't convince anyone of what you genuinely need to convince them of. So if you treat them as neutral or negative, it's a disaster. Um, even if what you're saying is true, so it's true that rights are in part about the absence of the initiation of force, but that's not their core. The initiation of force is an evil. The absence of it doesn't get you to something good. It doesn't tell you what rights are. It doesn't tell you why force is evil. What it's interfering with, what it's interfering with is the exercise of human ability. And it's a particular type of interference that blocks and stops the reasoning mind or the reasoning productive mind. It's the only evil that can literally stop it, which is why it has to be banned. But it all has to be couched in terms of a positive. Or if you think of the common formulation, you get this from libertarians and many others, do whatever you feel like doing so long as you respect the same rights of others. Now leave aside that this is actually contentless in terms of what it, it's trying to delineate something, but there's actually no content here. But if you leave that aside, do whatever the hell you feel like doing and then let other people do that. What's so important about that? Why well, think that's valuable? Why are you mounting a crusade for that? There's no answer to those questions. It's part of what, when she talks about libertarianism of her day and the libertarian of her days, emptying crucial principles of their philosophical meaning. This is one instance of that. Or another kind of formulation that is often given. My right to swing my fist ends where your nose begins. Now there is a use to that kind of formulation. The issue of the demarcation of rights is important. But if this is all you got, it doesn't convince anyone, and it shouldn't convince anyone. I mean, it, what's the image it portrays is I'm walking around swinging my fists, and I can't do that if your nose is there. Why do I want to do that? Why is that what life is about? There's no answer to that question. <clears throat> and Ayn Rand never looks at rights like this, even though she will use formulations like it's about the absence of the initiation of physical force. That's not the essence of the case for rights. The essence of the case has to be put in terms of positives and the positive that it is unleashing is the full recognition of human ability. So everywhere, and as I said, this is not an exhaustive list, but everywhere you look in objectivism, what you have is a new and very different orientation towards human ability. What it's, objectivism is about a love for productive ability, or you could even say, and this is the way Ayn Rand formulates it, it's about a reverence for pr productive activity. And let me qu end <coughs> with a quote from Atlas Shrugged. This is from Galt's speech. It's one of my favorite passages from Galt's speech, and not just because it's insulting my ancestors. It's, it gives this whole new orientation, and that this is what life should be about. So this is Galt to the world. You who claim that you long to rise above the crude concerns of the body, above the drudgery of serving mere physical needs, who is enslaved by physical needs? The Hindu who labors from sunrise to sunset at the shafts of a hand plow for a bowl of rice? Or the American who is driving a tractor? Who is the conqueror of physical reality? The man who sleeps on a bed of nails? Or the man who sleeps on an inner spring mattress? Which is the monument to the triumph of the human spirit over ma matter? The germ-eaten hovels on the shoreline of the Ganges? Or the Atlantic skyline of New York? Unless you, learn to answer to, unless you learn the answer to these questions and learn to stand at reverent attention when you face the achievement of man's minds, <clears throat> you will not stay much longer on this earth. And that is what Atlas Shrugged is about, and that is what objectivism is about, this orientation towards life. Thank you.
Thank you. So let's open it up to questions, and Tara will be joining me. Okay. Yeah, we have a, it's a little hard to see you, but go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, would you comment on uh, what are the roots of the animosity toward human ability? Does it all, in the end, boil down to religion? Um, I don't think it all boils down to religion. The, the, one of the articles to read on this to get Ayn Rand's view of it is The Age of Envy, um, where she talks about the development of this kind of mentality uh, and of uh, and what a proper orientation towards ability and more generally to human values, to all the things that further human life is, and how a uh, mentality wired in reverse. Uh, so the, so, and this is what she calls hatred of the good for being the good, that the response to values is hatred. It's, it's a complex development. I think it's much more psychological than it is um, straight indoctrination by a particular ideology. It's, and her view of these kinds of things is often the, your psychological propensities by, because of the choices you've made in life and towards what, so if you think of Eddie Willers and Jim, uh, Jim Taggart towards Francisco, there's choices involved in what, what are you going to do, how to evaluate this, why are you responding in this way to someone who's demonstrated tremendous ability. And a sort of mentality can develop, and, but it's a very complicated story, I think, of how that mentality develops. And the age of envy is Ayn Rand's, one of Ayn Rand's detailed explanations of the development of that. And you pick up ideologies because they help you preserve, foster, and carry into the world this outlook this, that you've developed. She calls it a psychoepistemological outlook, and it has a corollary of this is the nature of the world, therefore, that fits this psychoepistemology. It's a very complicated story. But it's, you pick up ideologies because they give sanction and expression to this mentality that you're developing. <clears throat> so it's not, and, it, and it's much more than religion. One of the things she talks about is how almost every culture has myths about if you grow too big, to, to put it in terms of grow, and have too much ambi ambition, you take a chariot towards the sun, and so, that you're knocked down and you deserve to be knocked down. Um, and she thinks this, that kind of mentality is loose in the world. Ideologies help bring it and give it prominence and power, but they're not the source, or they're not the only source of it. I don't know if you want to say more on that. I'll just add one or two things, but um, I mean, I think religion plays a role sometimes, and I don't think you would dispute that, but I do think what you're saying is really interesting about how psychology is often underneath why people even are attracted to the religions that they are. Because um, I was also going to say, I think self-esteem for a lot of people, self-esteem problems can feed into this. But again, you know, as you said, the antithesis of Ayn Rand's attitude is this hatred of the good for being the good. And that is so much what she's exploring in Atlas. It's like these people who do not want to live. And I think you know, if you've only read Atlas once, the first pass, you know, what the hell is she talking about there? People who don't really you know, want to live. And this is what we see some of the psychological exploration that Dagny and Hank are coming to about people's, those attitudes that generate a lot of hatred. So the know. psychology would come first, then the ideology. It's a complex interplay, I think, between the two. Another interesting thing to read is the development of Tui in the Fountainhead. Um, and because he has a similar orientation to Johnny Stokes and, and to a person of ability and the resentment that starts to form that builds into hatred. And then he picks up religion because it helps give a whole expression. to it. And then he discards religion and picks up socialism. <clears throat> and that, that, that's very deliberate of what is going on in the Fountainhead. But religion can really screw up your psychology. Yeah. So I mean, I'm yeah. here to tell you, okay, <laughs> just so you know. Thank you. All right. Um, my my question has maybe I can. My question has to do with uh, Howard Rourke. You talked about how he uh, 
his commitment to reshaping the world in, in the image of his values. And I'm wondering if you could comment on what Ayn Rand would have said about the Howard Rourke as a 10, 12, 14 year old boy. How does he get to the point where he's developing values and coming up with an image of those values uh, in the context of a society or culture that, uh, that doesn't promote that, that uh, seems to, to discourage that? Can I say something? Um, I'm trying to think what to say in a short period of time. It's, it's a, we don't live in such an awful culture that it's d difficult and certainly not impossible, but I don't actually even think it's that difficult to preserve a value orientation. You can make a lot of errors, you can be taught a lot of bad things, but to preserve a value orientation towards life and find particular values that you enjoy in life, that you want to learn about, that you want to foster. I mean, we have tremendous choices. We have tremendous control over our lives in the modern world. I mean, this is part of what, I'm not one of the objectivists who bemoans the modern world and wants to go back to ancient Greece. I don't want to live in ancient Greece. Uh, and I'd likely be a slave in ancient Greece. It, though there's many things to admire about it. We live in an era um, where you have more control over your life than you ever have had. And you can develop in childhood real interests, real values, and you can pursue them and have the means to pursue And that's the kind of thing that Rourke is doing, I think. And, what, and you see this orientation towards life, uh, towards Cameron, for instance, and that he wants to learn from Cameron. He, he finds this great example of building. He wants to be a builder like that. Um, he's going to emulate, not copy, but emulate the principles that drive Cameron. He goes to study with Cameron. That kind of thing you can do and people can do. Now, it's true to get a, a proper moral perspective on the world is much more difficult. Um, and to fully get, I mean, this is part of what Ayn Rand offers through the novels, and this is one of the crucial, important points about the fiction and why they have an appeal to young people. They give a whole value, value orientation at a metaphysical moral level that I think is hard to get from the mod, but it's hard to get from any world. This was one of her views about romanticism, that one of the crucial important things about romanticism th is that it can offer a, a moral point of view. So as she talks about it in the Romantic Manifesto as it appeals to a person with a moral sense of life. And you can be developing that sense of life through your choices. But there are things that foster it, and there are things that undercut it. And there are things in the modern world that undercut it. But there are many, many opportunities to foster it as well. Can I add just a little bit, too? I think when we, when we think about Rourke, or I'm sorry, when we think about productive work as reshaping reality in the image of your values, you know, it's important not to think of that just in the most grandiose ways or people who have a vision for rewriting reality. He really liked building. Now, also bear in mind, that was a novel. And I mean, architecture is a, a, a career and a kind of work of a certain grand scale, right? But whatever it is, just going back to the little kid, he really likes building this kind of thing or solving that kind of problem. Or I really enjoy trying to clarify issues. So whatever it is, you know, your kind of interested mm -hmm. nugget of reality, I, do th I completely agree that you, know, you can develop those interests and pursue them in productive work. Thank you. So it's probably no secret to most people that there's a lot of successful businessmen who have a tendency towards left-wing politics and left-wing causes. And my interpretation of their mindset is essentially, um, you know, it's okay for me to make money and it's okay for me to be successful, but not for anybody else, especially if that person uh, threatens to become a competitor of mine and who could threaten to thwart my success. So I'm wondering, like, uh, from your perspective, is the root of that, is that some sense of guilt for their success, or is it this, uh, this feeling of um, being threatened by others who might be able to compete with them? What exactly is the root of sort of this shift towards left-wing politics w when you see um, businessmen become more and more successful? 
Do you have anything in mind? Because I don't think of that as a pattern that as businesses become, or businessman becomes more and more successful. Well, I think move. of people like Richard Branson, Michael Moore, Warren Buffett, not Michael Moore so much, but like Bill Gates, you know, his comments on capitalism and, um, you know, how, how frequent this seems to be. But I didn't quite follow the question either. We, I mean, it's one thing for somebody to be a successful businessman and have left-wing giveaway kinds of politics, but then it also sounded like you were saying they resent their competitors. So I'm not sure which. Well, a lot of them lean towards sort of cronyism and higher taxes, so that would sort of lead towards a threat against them somehow. I mean, I'll say a few things. I'm not sure it's exactly addressing what you're asking, but if you take someone like a Bill Gates, I think there is an element of guilt there, or at least an element of I should feel guilty, um, and this is what I should be doing uh, as a result. And I've been um, denounced, and I've had the so-called Justice Department come after me for being too successful. So this is what I should be doing. How much he really feels that, I don't know, and I'm, I mean, I don't know him and so on. When he talks about it, I find it very interesting, the things he describes, and the greatest part of my life was creating Microsoft. It's a, it's a mixed, ambivalent attitude, I think, towards what he is doing now, and I think there's an element of he's supposed to be doing it, he doesn't really want to do it. Whether he feels guilty deep down or not, or he feels that he should feel guilty, those are complicated questions, and you would have to know the individual to know what is going on. But certainly the culture pushes towards you should feel guilt for what you're doing. Um, and the fact that he was the richest man in the world at the height of business success, the most uh, profitable and, and in certain ways powerful company in the world. I mean, there's a tremendous pressure on him, moral pressure, that what you're doing is wrong. Um, <clears throat> what impact that had, I think it had some impact. It's debatable what exactly the nature of that impact is, and you would need to know many more things. But the more general phenomenon of that business, or many businessmen lean left. I don't have a view that the left is all corrupt. So if the left just means the, the, it, some favor of the welfare state and so on, and what he should be doing is leaning right. The right is in various ways an abomination, I think. Um, and, um, and if you, so I put up on the slide conservatives and Ayn Rand's attitude towards conservatives. She did not think people should be moving towards conservatives. She, I mean, the article is conservatism an obituary, and she says the earlier conservatives didn't really offer any argument for capitalism, and now they found the need, and it's partly, I think, that Ayn Rand has been pushing, you need an argument for what capitalism, and you need a moral perspective on capitalism. So, okay, we'll have an argument and moral perspective, and what they pick up, and it, she puts it as three interrelated arguments of an appeal to faith, an appeal to, to tradition, and an appeal to man's depravity. Man's not good enough for collectivism and socialism. He has to live in this imperfect system because he's imperfect. And, so, <clears throat> and she viewed that like, this is a complete capitulation, and I think she sees it as it's a complete capitulation on defending the man of ability. <laughs> You're gonna offer him faith and tradition, and you're depraved? The, and, and it's interesting she puts, she does not put, the worst of these arguments is an appeal to faith. Though you might think, well, faith versus reason, that's the fundamental and it's about, that's mysticism. So her view is the worst is that you're depraved. And if you think of it in terms of the Industrial Revolution, what that showcases is that man is capable and man is not depraved. And that the conservatives are gonna pitch to man the sinful, your sinful, lowly nature is really, really bad in terms of motivation. And these are the conservatives who are at her day who are better than many people on the right today. So the, I do not classify people, particularly non-philosophical people, so whether they lean left or they lean right. There's many reasons I think Silicon Valley leans left, and many are legitimate. If you think of, if I pick up the right, it's picking up the religious right and the racist right, and so who are viewed as all this is a part of the right, and so Nobody in their sane mind is going to pick that up. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't look at the phenomenon, I think, in the way that you look at it. Thank you. Yeah, I would just say, um, I mean, just one thing to add is you spoke really in a lovely way, I think, about idealism. And these people who you're, the questioner is referring to, I mean, they have not, I mean, they're very compartmentalized. 
So they have no clue of this new, con I mean, they are not reconceiving their ideals and idealism, and this is good what they're doing. It is, yeah, right, filthy secret. You were mentioning the cultural rejection of the products of reason and the productivity of that, and uh, I, talking about the movements to go back to the medieval times, back to nature, and to me, I identify in that uh, just a fear of change, of a profound conservatism that simply distrusts the products of reason uh, and technology going back to the early 1800s and following up through the modern environmentalist and the modern fear of robotics and AI. And I was wondering if you'd agree with that, if you think uh, it's, it's as much a fear of the different for being different as a hatred of the good for being good. If you'd have any comments on that or. Um, I think it's interesting to think about where such a deep-seated fear would come from. So I think, again, self-esteem issues and psychological issues that Ankar was talking about earlier would play a role. Yeah, and, and if the, so I don't think, particularly if you're, if you're getting at a culture-wide level, it's fear of the different for being different. Um, I don't think that's a real fear, or it's different. Um, it's much more a fear of being able to cope with the different and with the new. But in that regard, it's often, it's not always, but it's often a self-expression. It's, I fear that I'll be able to cope with this new changing world where things change day by day, month by month, or hour by hour. I've got to learn new things. I've got to have a, I mean, my whole job and career might go out of existence, so I've got to reorient and so And that is demanding. It takes thought, it takes effort, it takes a commitment and a resolve to do that. And that, that one can, either shrug at the need to do that, be fearful, am I really capable of doing it? And that's the self-esteem kind of aspect. Am, will I be able to do that? C couldn't I just freeze things? Can't we just leave things alone and I can cope with this world? So it's much more that kind of attitude, I think, than it's a fear. Of, and I think Iran will talk about some of this in his uh, talk at the end of the conference. Um, but, and that's more than just, well, it's different. I don't like different things. <clears throat> So the computer revolution is often described as like a second wave of the industrial revolution. As philosophers, do you guys have any thoughts on what made that possible, or do you see it as largely just derivative of the first industrial revolution? That's a good question, and I'm a little embarrassed to say I have no clue and haven't thought about it. So, I mean, in the sense that it's like, well, I'm not doing what Ayn Rand says you should be doing as an intellectual. So Ankar, you've got that covered, right? Um, <laughs> It's something I've thought about. It doesn't mean it's something I have definitive views about. In certain ways, it definitely is a continuation. Um, but in certain ways, you get new um, ideas. And I mean, the computer revolution is a revolution. It's not an incremental increase in technology. It's, it's radical new technology coming into existence. And some visionaries uh, who understood the potential and worked incredible amount of to bring that potential into existence. So it, it's, and, and in that sense, it's, you have these, industri I view like Gates and Jobs on the same, Steve Jobs, on the same scale as a Rockefeller and the, the kind of great industrialists who brought the re Industrial Revolution into full existence. Um, and you have, so it's, we bemoan and should bemoan the, the, controls, the regulations so that exist in the modern world that accelerate and in certain areas are crippling industry. But here was an industry that was relatively free. And that too is a consequence of the US. And so the, that combination of new ideas, new knowledge, new productive giants who are left free is the same kind of phenomenon as what the Industrial Revolution was. But there's new ideas, and to trace the new I and the new knowledge and new productivity, there's tremendous stories to be told there. And if part of the question is, is it will life 
including philosophy, re need rethinking if the world changes in 50 years as dramatically as it seems to be that it will change? I think the answer to that is yes. And what those new ideas and principles are, I mean, you can't specify in advance. Yeah. But it should, one should be thinking deeply about that issue and that question. Let me just add, I think it's a great example of what one of the other gentlemen, uh, one of the first questioners was asking about how growing up today in our society can a person think about how to reshape, I don't know how they did it, but God bless them, there are enough people out there, right? I mean, the Gateses, the little guy, I mean, you're there, you're doing it, so many people, so it's just a good, I think it should give us hope. Thank you. Okay, we have five minutes left. You, you touched on perfection in your, in your speech, and I was wondering if you might be able to touch on the concept of, per, of perfection uh, with respect to humans' ability to achieve it. And I mean, more particularly, like if you have, let's just say you have someone who has a perfect ethical framework and they've validated it and it's true and everything, uh, but their actual ability to apply it, uh, those abstract principles to particular concrete instances in reality may vary, it, it may err. Um, so I wonder if the, the proper way to think about perfection is an unerring application of ab uh, abstract principles which you formulated, or is it supposed to allow for your ability to make errors in accordance with your nature, and how to think about that concept more clearly? It's up to you. Um, so there, there's a to first give you something to read, uh, Dr. Binswanger wrote an article on, I forget what the title now is, but on perfection. Pardon? The possible dream. On the possible dream that deals with the concept of perfection. And you de if you're interested in it, you definitely should read that article. It was in the Objectivist Forum. Um, but the most important, I think, place that you need the concept of perfection is in morality. Um, but then it's not, it, the moral is the chosen. Ayn Rand stresses that in Atlas Shrugged. And she stresses that a proper conception of moral perfection is possible and is necessary. That you should be upholding your standards in morality that you have. And you should be upholding them consistently 100%. And that that's a matter of choice. So, and a matter of will. And the, one of the ways she formulates it, what it is, is an unbreached rationality, which means a commitment to know, to seek to understand, to grow your knowledge, to integrate it together. It's not a guarantee that you're going to do that properly. But the moral issue is, were you trying to do that? And if you notice how I formulated it about the intellectuals, who was trying to understand? <clears throat> they didn't get a full understanding, certainly from objectivism's perspective. That's not a moral failing. It's not a moral failing that they weren't Ayn Rand. But it is a moral failing if it is, well, they're partly trying to understand, partly evading, partly going to war against the phenomenon, but that is an element that is under your control and choice. And your basic motivation, to the extent that you can identify, and you should be seeking to try to understand your motivation and what is driving you in life, and to the extent that you can identify that, that also is under your control. So you have control over a tremendous amount of things, and what morality is about is make the right choice, make a good choice, and you can do that every time. Things can go wrong when you do that, because it's, it's only what's under direct will. But that in morality, where I think the concept of perfection is particularly necessary, and all past, or most past moral theories say moral perf perfection is impossible, because it's, and in, on their code it is true, that it's not, you can't actually even practice, and you wouldn't even know what trying to fully practice it means, because it would pulls you in different directions and so on. But, so, so that's a little bit, I mean, there's more to say on that, um, so but it it's touches on It's more concerned on with, with the, 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 um, the intent or the choices that you make and not the actual concrete application? Well, it's much more than intent. It's with your choices, but choices are not the same thing as an intent. It's actual of putting it into practice, into working towards it, putting in the effort. But you still might not succeed in doing that. Mm. Okay, thank you. I'll just add, many years ago, I gave a set of, I think, two lectures at an Ocon on pride and perfection. And if you have a minute afterwards, I'd be happy to talk to you a little bit more, because I have more to say. OK, I think this is the last question. I got the one minute sign. So. 
Um, two parts, actually. One part, the observation that you talk about the, um, the uh, Industrial Revolution being the aegis of all this, and yet prior to that you have uh, sort of a groundwork being laid in the 17th century with greater individualism in the sciences and greater freedom with the Royal Academy and the other ac academies that developed around Europe that gave, might have given rise to the revolution, industrial revolution. But the, the one thing that I was thinking that was more to the point, uh, we seem to argue that somehow the industrial revolution is a Western European and United States type of thing that isn't applicable or isn't usable in other countries. Uh, it's sort of a, uh, an ego thing, it seems like, with uh, Europe and the United States. And I, I'm wondering to what extent you feel the Industrial Revolution should be an ongoing activity, that it didn't end, and that it could be applied to third world nations and th they could be encouraged to utilize their own unique abilities to try to further uh, the progress that was made in the Industrial Revolution. Um, no, uh, India yeah, being one of them that I'm especially con uh, yeah, interested Yeah, I mean, it's in. so it definitely is the un Industrial Revolution and the principles that brought it into existence, are they of universal applicability, not a Western note? Yes, that's certainly true. That's true of all truths. They're true, and they're true for all people, okay. and they're applicable for all people. But and it's also true that the people who are concerned with development in the rest of the world. This is what they should be concerned with, bringing the Industrial Revolution and all its conditions, including its political and scientific conditions, a body of knowledge, principles of freedom, law, constitution, and respect for property rights. That's what should be brought into the second and third worlds. That's what China needed. That's what India needs and now is getting something of that. That's what Africa needs. And this I put up on the I'll make this the last point. I put up on the list of the way Ayn Rand looks at the world from the perspective of human ability. I put humanitarians and social workers. Mm -hmm. And it's somewhat startling how much of a negative view Ayn Rand has of humanitarians and social workers. But if you look at it from this perspective, that the typical so-called humanitarian and social worker, what animates them and their orientation in life is towards chronic need and that that's what's significant that's what we have to minister that's what we to that's what we have to alleviate rather than it uh, orientation towards human ability and what makes the unleashing of human ability possible and that that's what everybody needs if there that were their orientation it would not be about uh, bringing aid to India and they would remain in poverty forever. It would be about bringing the Industrial Revolution and the Constitution of the United States and so on to the rest of the world. And that was her focus and why I think she was so adamantly against the people who a very, very different orientation towards life. Thank you. Sure. Thank you.